This is the Ruckus and the Menace Sports Podcast. Oh no! We suck again! I'm getting confused. What game are you calling? I'm calling both games! It is caught by Kelsey! Touchdown! Kansas City! Anthony for three! Bang! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Ruckus and the Menace, episode number 69. Nice. Uh, I am Ruckus, always causing a ruckus, as per usual, and here is... <laughs> and I'm Spanish, sir. I'm Spanish the Menace. And today, whenever you listen to this awesomeness, um, we have a good show for you. Uh, we have our pregame warm-ups, as per usual, the starting lineup, the good, the bad, the ugly, which is our Clint Eastwood segment. Woo! Whoa, whoa. And then we have our film room. It's our, back, baby. And our high heat, which is always hot. Uh, color commentary, which might be too colorful. And then our primetime game. And well, then... A recap of last week's primetime game, anyway. Yeah, 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 what he said. Um, And then um, our stun dud of the week. So, what have you been up to, Spinis the Menace? So, in this case right now, if we were to kind of channel the Kelseys, although one is injured, this is our new news segment. New news. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We're just a couple couple days away from couple days away from hitting the road uh, for Nashville so there will be there will be a segment and I think I've already kind of thought of the title of that partic- of that particular segment and that's going to be Music City Menace <laughs> There you go um or Music City Spanish, whichever we kind of... But I have been keeping up with... With the... Madden filming. Um, my goal was... I am ahead of schedule on filming. Or on my... Production side. Um, I am on schedule... I am actually set to be... I think I'm two weeks ahead of schedule on filming, and I am a week ahead of schedule on post. Um, or at least I am about to be a week ahead of schedule on post. So, no spoilers as far as what my record is for the franchise race. But... But let's just say I am up until up until Friday I'm 3 and 0. There you go. There you go. So yeah, 3 and 0 heading into heading into two games across the pond. But but other than that, I mean I've mostly been doing Jags franchise work, a lot of road travel, uh, finally completing a big money deck. Um, it turned out that I actually ended up with a whole bunch of, uh, that b- before last week's episode, I'd gone to a pre-release and pulled pulled straight heat from packs that ended up turning into turning into major value for my big money deck that I, or a bigger money deck that I had because of the commander that I pulled about a month prior. So that deck is now complete. Um, I also was able to teach my wife the basics of Disney Lorcana. We haven't played again since, but trying to do a little bit of teaching her how to play that and then eventually 
figuring out time to soup up the decks. But in podcast in major podcast news, my set my setup pieces will soon be getting an upgrade. Thanks to Ruckus himself. <laughs> you are very welcome for that. Um <laughs> that is for sure. Uh I figured he needed the upgrade more than I needed the parts. Uh but yeah, um I'm very excited for you, my dude. Yeah, my goal is to so there may be a little bit of lag on some things post Nashville. Post Nashville because the goal is to try and the goal is to try and build it. And I may be and I think I may also have there there will be some sort of also a delay or some reconfiguring of figuring out how to do some episodes right around late September, early October, because I will be at the opposite house. I will be taking care of my grandfather with my wife, so I may leave the house, like, I may do one of those, leave the, leave my parents' house, come here, record, and then come back or something like that. Mm -hmm. Kind of just talk that out with, talk that out with my wife and figure out what podcast life is going to look like for that just it it should involve no cancellation of episodes okay i just have to kind of talk that out <laughs> honestly no worries whatever happens but yeah we can talk that out well i mean this is actually it's more so going to be conversations with with my wife and i but at least as far as figuring out what podcast night will look like, as far as what the night I will be recording will look like. But fortunately, I think it's only one night. I think it's only one night that we have to do that. Only one episode. Yeah. So that's, and that will be the second episode post Nashville. Actually, wait, no, that might be the third episode post-Nashville. Yeah, yeah, it'll be the third episode post-Nashville. So that will be episode... So the so that'll be episode 72. That we'll have to figure out. We may okay. have to figure out and pull some strings. But, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge once we get there. Yep. What's been going on with you, Ruckus? Oh, well, um, funny you ask. Uh, I've been playing a little bit of Madden, uh, tearing my hair out because I've been playing my own personal Madden save for uh, the Chiefs, and I got a little bit ahead and played, I think, week four or five when uh, the Chiefs play the Jets, and playing Rodgers has been a... It, you know how like it was a chess match to play uh, Mahomes with the Jaguars. Oh yeah. Oh, like how I had to do that in week two. Yeah. To I don't know if the chess match means that uh Peyton Manning or whoever would like change the play on you every time you like change the play on them. Oh, like, you're, oh, I, oh! It wasn't just Mahomes, but Mahomes was a big culprit. Josh Allen was doing it to me. No spoilers. No spoilers, but I will say Josh Allen has done it. I'm pretty sure I may end up running into Rodgers at some point as well. It's goddamn annoying. Like, I remember back in the day when I was playing with another team, like, Peyton Manning was like, Omaha, Omaha! And then he would, like, do some other crap, and I'm just like, great, I can't <laughs> run a blitz on this guy. He's just gonna switch it over. I'm like, no! God damn it! Just play the other one, you... you... <laughs> <laughs> you oh, whip take the bull by the horns <laughs> and he just didn't want to do it and the same was with Rodgers but it is what it is Um, I learned how to do some uh, mineral mining in Starfield as well Um, I found I was looking up on the internet that uh, if you go to a certain planet you can 
uh, easily mine most of what you need, and then um, I upgraded my ship, and I've been just playing through that a little bit. Other than that, uh, not a whole lot. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, hoopla that happened on Thursday, but um, Star- do you want me Starfield, to go ahead? Starfield for me has become a... It went from a game that I was super hyped for to kind of a game that now I want a soft pass because I feel that the pacing of the game may be too slow. Oh, it, it definitely is a little bit slow. Yeah, I... Not that I don't like a slow-paced think amount game. If I'm going to do that... I don't necessarily want like I feel like com I feel like combat in Starfield is gonna be slow. Or non existent. Combat in general in that game it can be fast paced. But the problem is um uh, figuring out where it happens. That's all I'm gonna say. Oh yeah, I just think the flow of the game like <clears throat> It's a game that I thought would be something outside of what Bethesda's norm is. But I think it's just Bethesda staying in their own lane and reskinning for typing. And for me, the Bethesda mold, at least for their main core stuff, being like Elder Scrolls, Fallout, and Starfield, and now Starfield joining that realm of those type of games, is not for me. I liked their faster pace with Deathloop. Right, yeah, because it was like more. It was more like okay, you got to quickly figure out how to do this and this per day and per night cycles and stuff like that, like. Yeah, but their combat. Yeah, but their combat didn't feel like it felt fast, but it felt fair. It felt fair while being fast. Right. It wasn't like you had to, like, figure out which storyline to do where. It was more so just like when versus how. Oh yeah, and then figuring out well, figuring out where you needed to go when you needed to go there. It's like. To me, it felt like Fallout with that with like extra like different things you could do, and yes, you could do main quests and whatnot. But it's hard to dictate that whenever you're like looking at the objectives at the beginning, not realizing that they're filtered by main and whatever objectives. And the same compared... was done with the, with the uh, Cyberpunk as well, because Cyberpunk was definitely like okay, you're doing X objective versus A objective. And then you're trying to figure out, wait, which one is the main objective and which one was one that you wanted to do or were doing at the time. I compared uh, Deathloop more to like Bioshock and how heavy and how heavy the combat weapons felt. Mm-hmm. I felt that I, f- I compared it more to Bioshock with really a. There wasn't really penalties for going loud. Like, there were certain bonuses to going stealth, or to going stealth, but you didn't have to go stealth all the time. There were times where you could go loud and it was fine, or going loud didn't affect too many other outside outcomes. So there was almost, so there was practically no penalty for going loud. There was no, or or at least no major like no real major like nothing that you couldn't redo yeah like you weren't failing a stealth mission or anything it was you just you just gave the option of going loud rather than going stealth like there's some games that'll penalize you for it and deathloop did a great job of not doing that <laughs> I mean, they mainly penalize you for what you didn't do to uh, get the kills that you needed. 
And really, most of the time, like, the major penalty with it was that if you didn't save the... didn't save the residual, you just had to redo... We just had to redo whatever you had. Yeah. Like, it was a roguelike... That's why I said it was a... It was really Bioshock meets a... Film noir styled mystery game where you had like unraveling different clues for certain things to help you solve the mission or to solve the ultimate objective, along with a little cross of a roguelite, a roguelite game. Like, and it did it effectively. That's why it weren't garnered what it did. So for me, like, Starfield is just... It's gone from a game that I would have a whole lot of interest in to a game that I honestly have no... I now no longer have an interest in, and I would rather do the turn-based RPG things with Baldur's Gate once I... Once I get... Once I get it and have friends involved. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because Starfield is more of a uh, single player game, anywho. So it's like, oh, okay. Oh yeah, but but this is like, okay, I can plan some time. I can set aside time to play Baldur's Gate with with whatever friends I want to have with, or or play Baldur's Gate, or if I decide to do one with my own file, play Baldur's Gate and kind of have a few different characters going and figure it out. Yeah. Like, or, or just have Baldur's Gate on my Christmas list and play it, like, right around the time of the new, like, right around the time, like, starting the new year and, and just have Spider-Man ready to go next month. Have myself more so ready to go for Spider-Man next month. Yeah. Probably, and this is all the while having PC parts ready. So, such is life. <laughs> <laughs> but now we go into our actual starting lineup. And, Ruckus, I know we've. I know that we normally, for our starting lineup, especially because we have especially for these type of episodes, we're right around the NFL season, that we normally save the NFL for our major segments, but you just had to all of a sudden, oh, something breaking that kind of has to take precedence here. Yep, and that breaking news came from today around Monday afternoon, which of recording is Monday night. Um into Tuesday. Um, so Chris Jones, he signs a one-year contract with the Kansas City Chiefs uh, to, uh, I guess, kind of restructure what was going on with the final part of his deal. Um, uh, it sounds... To me, I don't know how to feel about the contract. I think... It's more of a, okay, prove the fact that you are worth this amount of money. But part of me also feels like this is like his final hoorah. Maybe he goes to another team and gets more money after the fact. Because Veach does not like to sign big contracts to players that are about 30 years old and more. Let alone 29. Yeah, I mean, I think the it's not just Veach that's doing that. That is just the NFL has shifted to that meta. It's not Veach alone. It is the NFL. Because, look, this was the same thing that happened... With the running backs. And Chris Jones was getting a little salty about not getting his money. 
starting to turn into Mr. Krabs from SpongeBob SquarePants over here. Rogus, you're fired. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Well, I'm kidding. it was nice I'm on kidding. you, Spenis. Uh, Ruckus and the Menace. Kidding, this but... is this is the last me episode of Ruckus and the Menace Sports Podcast number sixty-nine. Nice. <laughs> I like it. All right, Spenis. What? I was just going with the like, the because you know that's a common thing that Mr. Crab. I know. I'm just <laughs> trying to roll with the punches. <laughs> that was good. You're welcome. Oh, but down to the things that were not <laughs> not NFL related. Your U.S. Open champions in tennis were Novak Djokovic and Coco Goff. Coco Goff being the American in the bunch. I, I will mention more about this in the Eastwood segment. Luis Rubiales officially resigns as the Royal Spanish Football Federation's president due to allegations against him from the fallout of the kiss to Jenny Armoso at the end of the FIFA Women's World Cup. The FIBA World Cup was won by the Germans. They defeated the U.S. in the semifinals and Serbia in the final, but the U.S. does not come away with any medal in this prior to leading into the Paris Olympics next year as Canada Defeated them in the third place game in overtime. Yes, this actually happened. We got beat by Canada. Sorry we about got that. Beat by the... No, I was I was gonna go with we got <laughs> beat by the people in South Park whose heads are split from their bodies. Hey, <laughs> buddy, <laughs> I ain't your split. guy, buddy. <laughs> 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 Oh, but I'm sorry. Blame Trey Parker and Matt Stone and Canada. <laughs> and their maple syrup. I don't even I don't even use maple syrup. Neither do I, but I ain't your guy, buddy. <laughs> Terrence. Alright. Let's go to the Eastwood segment before we let this go entirely too far out of control. Alright, I'm gonna give you the Clint Eastwood stink eye <laughs> as I do the Oh and I will start with the good this week. And the good is that the is American tennis players making the semifinals in both the men's and women's US USA, Open. USA, USA. Okay. <laughs> now, in the in the women on the women's side, of course, Coco Golf winning the winning the U.S. Open, but for the men's, but for the men's side. I believe it was a uh, Ben Sh Ben Shelton. Yeah, Ben Shelton was the semifinalist for the men who who took on Novak Djokovic and lo who lost to Djokovic in the semifinals. And Novak Djokovic, of course, in that one, trolled him a bit by doing the hang up the phone celebration. Meanwhile, of course, that also ended with Djokovic winning because Carlos Alcaraz lost the semifinals. The 20 year old rising star that we were just talking about who was the number one player in the world. But it was, but that semifinal was the number one overall seed, the number two overall seed, the number three overall seed, and then there was Ben Shelton. So, I knew Shelton was not making it much further out of there. 
And then the bad this week, and I will let Ruckus take it away here. All right, Jason Dominguez. That that is correct, right? Jason Dominguez. Yes, Jason Dominguez. <laughs> and his oh, it wasn't his nickname the Martian. I don't know if at... his was the Mar- it might have been the Martian. Anyways, Mr. Jason Dominguez needed Tommy John surgery shortly after being called up. And you know what that means? The Yankees lose. <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, yes. This is a net loss for the Yankees. Okay, repeat it with me though, here. Though, the Yankees, Yankees lose. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, even though this was probably more so for me being a Red Sox fan, this is good. Like, this is still bad for baseball because these pro like Tommy John surgery is not an easy, an easy recovery. Let alone that, but like the fact that Yankees fans were asking for this man to be called up like at the beginning of the season or before then. And then now they're like, Oh, let's call him up. It'll be fine. Everything is fine. And then Nope. Uh, <laughs> that shit ain't happening because his Tommy John snapped. But at the same time, like, come on. It was a UCL, yep. Is UCL even then, even then, they had Josh Donaldson, which was on, like, hanging on a thread. And then you also had Isaiah Connor Fluffa and others. But even then, they could have let uh, Donaldson walk with his dignity. They could have had Dominguez in there. But no. That's just me. And then on top of this, the other bad that may be a little bit more NFL related and breaking, Aaron Rodgers is not going to play the second half of the yep. game tonight. His so x-rays were negative close. on his ankle. Yeah, but it's probably it's probably just a sprained ankle, which even Drake says, boy, that ain't nothing to play with. Well, I was just uh Going off of what the thing was saying for his x-ray, I didn't mean to say that his negative x-ray meant that he should just play. But yeah, they ain't nothing to play no, with. No, no, I was going with the, the spray. There was a musical reference in there. Yeah, I know. It was, um, it was, uh. <laughs> from, forever, from forever. With yeah, Mike. yeah, that, I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah, it was a Drake reference. <laughs> But all thanks right. to all the locals, I ain't hating on a first name basis. Right? Or is that Lear Crow? Something wrong? like. Uh, I can't think of. Can't remember that one from the same line, but I mean. Choose to have more class, we know. Swimming in the money, come and find me at Nemo. <laughs> uh, okay, before we get even deeper into Canadian based rappers. The downright ugly in in sports this week. Sorry, buddy. Was not so much the the fact that our Bryles was there. It was the uh, the ugly more so is the optics surrounding the Oklahoma Sooners offensive coordinator Jeff Levy and Art Bryles on the field po- post game against Southern Methodist. Let me explain. Or this this takes a little bit of context here. The reason why Bryles was there is that he is the father-in-law of the Sooners offensive coordinator Jeff Levy. But More so the major issue is who it is it is the question of who is Art Bryles? Now Art Bryles is a disgraced head coach for a Big Twelve rival, Baylor. But oh 
he was a he was a coach for a rival school. I could you could see why that initially at first could look like a problem. But there is an even bigger problem stacked on top of that. That were disgraced. What happened? He was fired from Baylor due to not due to a lack of response to allegations of players that he had with sexual assault claims. His his mishandling of that was ultimately what led to his termination. So it's kind of put him on a little bit of a that he's kind of blackballed or like canceled. So it kind of optically didn't sit well. It doesn't really sit well. With kind of the the media and kind of their take on their take on things. And this is a whole six, seven years after all of that happened. So take that for what you will. (laughs) That's kind of the best way to explain that. Yeah. But now we go into a now a a segment making its return. And that is the film room. Now, compared to what we have last year, we are not recording on the same day of the week. So, with us now recording on Mondays, Monday Night Football will be live, will probably be will be more live spoken about during our podcast episodes. So, if a Monday night football game is involved in an episode prior to it as it is being aired and in our in in our film room predictions, it will be in our still to be scored portion. And, and our system this year is not by wins and losses. It is actually by a point system this year. Because of this. Every game last week was one point. However, you will see it this week, and you may see, and you may even see some larger point values for even bigger landscapes of games. Just a heads up on that ruckus. So, in short, say... Like, say, right around Thanksgiving time, Alabama and Auburn are kind of right around the top five, like they were about a certain amount of time ago. Yeah. Like, a standard rivalry game in certain cases, oh, that's two points. That could bump it up to, like, three. The the BCS, like, the college football playoff games. That BCS National Championship is likely going, and I'm going to, and kind of a little bit of a spoiler, what's ahead, that, that's going to be more than three points. The Super Bowl, which ultimately closes us out, is going to be more than is going to be more than it's your standard fair points. Which most of the time our standard fair points is going to be oh, one, two. But then we also will have a a lock of a wild card game. Now, how this is going to work? We will have a list of games, and we are primarily going to be using this mostly for the NFL. College, it's just whatever we can kind of see is really, really good. But for the NFL, we will have we'll have our standard one point, two points, 
kind of thing for two points for kind of some elevated games. But the lock. You may only use it on a game that is not in our list of games to pick that are already worth one or two points or worth a certain amount of points already. So we have ones that are outside the pool. We can pick from any one of them. So Ruckus will have something for one game. I may have something for a game that is completely different. And if you're right, if, you, if we're right, it's worth two points. But this is the only way we can lose a point. We can only lose a point if we get it wrong. There may be some future twists in this as well, especially as we get down to the point of more of more games being played. Of more games being played, um, well, maybe less games being played, or maybe something of a smaller amount of games that we possibly could have some future twists to this, but the film room is getting some new tweaks and we're going to try and keep it a little bit fresher and kind of add new new wrinkles and new challenges to it to make it a little bit more than just your standard your standard pick 'em segment in an episode. How you feel on that, Ruckus? I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling confident. All right. Well, let's get right to it. Your our first game. LSU Mississippi State in co- in the college ranks. Go Tigers. Yeah, I am taking LSU as well. Also for one point. Tennessee Florida. This is where I differ from you. Florida. I am I got to go with UT. And then go UT ahead. is also ranked 11th in the nation. So So that is why I am taking the chalk that one. And for 2 points, the backyard brawl. WVU versus Pitt. Country home, take me home to the place have a long West Virginia cow mama country roads. West Virginia. And yes, I said country homes at the beginning. Oh my. I am also taking WVU. Although I would go with the other other thing that would be said, but we will we will keep this thing to a to a reasonable to a reasonable thing. Cause West Virginia is are absolute dogs. I wasn't gonna go that far. But. Oh, okay. <laughs> But Pat McAfee did go to was the punter for WVU and was an absolute dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right, All right, Vikings Eagles. All right, for one point, Vikings Eagles. Hmm. I'm gonna really say like Vikings. Kirk, really, really like Kirk Cousins, but I am taking the Eagles. Chiefs Jaguars. Chiefs Jags. Come on now, I gotta go Chiefs. Uh, I actually am gonna take, and ironically enough, here, here, hear me out. If these Chiefs receivers struggle at any point in that game to hang on to the football, like they did against Detroit. The Jacksonville Jaguars will 
make them pay. And I think Trevor Lawrence could eventually figure out a way to pick up that Chiefs defense. And they improved also on their kicker with having Brandon McManus. So I am taking... I am going to be taking the Jacksonville Jaguars. It's an aggressive thing for two points. But if at the rate we're looking at right now, I will have a I could have a single point lead going into going into next week, so I can afford it. Yeah. For um, one point. For one point. Seahawks Lions. I'm going Seahawks, I believe, in the room that is the uh, Seahawks with Gino and and company. I think I, I think that the Lions showed something also against the Chiefs. A, just a matter of a few short days ago. Plus, they have a little bit of a longer rest going into that. I'm I'm taking Motor City Dan Campbell coaching up the Lions to have them really ready. Taking Detroit. Chargers Titans. Um, I have the Los Angeles Chargers because uh reasons and Titans uh looked lost against um The Saints. Yep. I mean it was a close game, but at the same time, like the Saints looked like they had a better advantage. At the end of the day, Tannehill was getting uh, messed or getting roughed up and just didn't look like he had to answer. All right. Well, 49ers ran. Ta- I also, I oh, also am taking the Chargers. I also am taking the Chargers. The reason why I am taking the Chargers, in spite of their defense being like Swiss cheese against the Miami Dolphins, why else in the world would I say that, yeah, you basically gave up 200 yards to Tyreek Hill. You gave up 200 yards to Tyreek Hill. If Tennessee can figure out any sense of the way to throw the ball on you like like Miami did, the Chargers could be in trouble. But I don't think, I think that they will offensively, that the Chargers offensively will put themselves in a much better position than what, than what the defense will leave them with. So I am taking the Chargers. 49ers Rams, I think we're both in agreement here. Niners. Yep. This was a game that this was a game that I think if it were played a little bit more toward the middle of the season and the records were very, very high standard, this could be a two pointer, but it's only gonna be for one. One tonight. Or one this week. And our wild card lock. This is the one where it's plus two if we're right, and we lose one if we're wrong. The question I have here for you, Ruckus, are you sticking with what you got down? Yes, sir. I'm going with the Dolphins being the Patriots and improving to 2-0. and So if I uh, mess this up and the Patriots win, I lose you, one point. You lose one point, yes. Now, I am... I am going to be a little more risk averse. And that is because I made a risky pick. I made a riskier pick in the in the games that were worth the worth the extra worth the standard amount of points in taking the Jaguars over the Chiefs. So I wanted to try and give me something that I know is gonna be a little bit more of a like solidified lock. And I am taking the Saints on Monday Night Football to get off to a 2-0 and start by beating the Carolina Panthers. 
the Carolina Panthers, granted that they got beat by the Atlanta Falcons, who also are not all that great, but there was just something about the connection between Derek Carr and Chris Olave. Though that the Panthers do have J.C. Horn, I think that there's something about that connection between Olave and Carr that has developed and that wide receiver core and somehow also being able to have some ability to try and run the ball effectively that I think the Saints can get it done. And I'm so I'm going to take the Saints. So while we are while we have now decided to looked at predicting ahead on what's going on next week, let's recap what we just went through this week. And we're going to kind of get right to it and start with the opener from Thursday night. And that is the, and we, what we're doing is that we have started with, we put five major games and a question that, that comes from, that comes from kind of the happenings of those games. And then for this week, for our color commentary, we, we kind of picked some games outside of that to kind of throw the overreaction radar is we is the overreaction radar going to stay as far as color commentary for next week? Maybe, maybe not. But, but we at least are having an overreaction radar for this week. So the question that kind of is left on people's minds, or at least mine, coming out of week one, involves the Kansas City Chiefs. The question here is, which Chiefs wide receiver will step up and fill the shoes of Travis Kelsey as a number one target while he is dealing with the bone bruise in his knee should he be out for any longer? Honestly, it's anybody's game at this point because, I mean, as far as the touches that Tony got, uh, last week, which was real bad, what might I add? Um, plus the fact that they decided not to use Justin Ross or any of the other guys that they could have used. Um, I don't know what's gonna what they're gonna do, and that's probably a good thing of that of what we don't know. But at the same time, like you were saying with the Kelsey statement there, I think. If Kelsey doesn't come in against the Jaguars and decides to take another week off from his uh, bone bruise, um, there I think they utilize Marquez more, MVS more, and or um, at least for the most part, if they're gonna use Tony, use him in like jet sweep scenarios and or red zone scenarios like you did in the Super Bowl and other games, like especially when you got him halfway through the season, like week six or week seven. Like, come on. I get uh, it was a bad game against the Lions. The offense did way worse than the defense. And yes, we could say, oh, Chris Jones wasn't there. But honestly, if I was... If, if I had to say anything about the Chiefs, I'd say that the defense did the best they could for what they had. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying that they held their own even without Chris Jones and still did what they could do. Um, the offense looked terrible. Like, terrible as in you could rip a sheet of paper from the copy machine and rip it in half and be like, yep, that sums it up about right. That offense could have done more. The Chiefs could have actually won a damn game against the Lions, which usually loses on Thanksgiving 
day or whenever they play. Usually it's Thanksgiving, but who gives a damn? They usually lose those games. But against a defending Super Bowl champs, the Chiefs lost against a Lions team that was trying to prove themselves, and they did it with no questions asked against an offense that looked lost. That is all. I think that the receivers were not to form heading out of the preseason and into the regular season. I think that the connection between Jared Goff and Amon Ross St. Brown got even stronger. Dude, that looks season. clean as hell with Amon Ra. Like, every time are... that Amon Ra got it from Goff was like the time whenever uh, Goff threw it to some to the Cooks or whomever he threw it to for that shootout that happened years ago at the Coliseum. Yeah, I mean, it's looked really good. Like, that's what clean, and I think Goff is also starting to develop that connection with with Josh Reynolds. With I Reynolds think, is also didn't Reynolds Marvin also jo- play? Sorry, go ahead. Reynolds was there last year. I was going to ask if Reynolds played for the Rams in uh, twenty nineteen or twenty eighteen. I don't know if he did because it's the Reynolds counterpart kind of sound familiar. But anyways, go ahead. Yeah, hang on. I'm going to double check that, but. Marvin Jones, I think, was the was the weak link in that one. Um, no, but Josh Reynolds, yeah, he actually was a re- of the Rams from 2017 to 2020, and was brought over to Detroit. He was more of a sidekick for the Rams at that point. Yeah, he was like a deeper, like deeper on the depth chart type of thing, but they claimed him off waivers prior to Goff even being there. So it kind of, or actually, as Goff was coming over there, really. Yeah. If you kind of put that into perspective, that kind of right around the time that they eventually. For Jared Goff, Josh Reynolds was there in Detroit. Amon Ross St. Brown was getting ready to be over there. So it's so it's like as if Goff had already started kind of working with them ahead of time. And Jared and that defense, like, give the Lions credit for where credit is definitely due in improving their team in the off season, especially through the draft as their three major picks that they had within two rounds in Jameer Gibbs, who some people even say he got underutilized. <laughs> Jameer Jack, Gibbs kicked Jack ass. Kim- like Jack Campbell on defense. And then also as a tight end that Jared Goff could go to in certain occasions, Sam Laporta. I think I am a believer that the Lions definitely did like they found the right pieces to fit the stance that Motor City Dan Campbell has put into place to really make that team even better. So yeah, the Chiefs the Chiefs stumbled. But I think the Lions in their massive improvement in their improvements on the on the offseason to set them up to th- to get to this point where they were able to surprise surprisingly win a week 1 game like this. I think that has to speak some volumes as well. And speak even some more volumes than what I even what I even thought prior to Thursday night. 
that's kind of where my head's at. Yeah. And kind of and kind of the reason why I believe that Detroit will will go to will go into playing Seattle and beat them. Here's my thing. I feel like they're more than just a okay, let's get them while they're sleeping kind of team. I think it's more of just how they how other teams react to Almond Ra and Goff. But yeah, like you said, well, I this think this is where this is where like a Josh Red where those developing things with Reynolds and Laporta kinda kick in to try and and even adding like Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery into that rhythm. Like get them settled into the fold, the offensive line improve for Detroit. And and just when people would think, oh, to oh, they would want to fire Dan Campbell. I am glad that the front office of the Lions, multiple years ago, when when they were not quite in this position, were kind of just put the ding that somebody somebody I think it might have even been the owner, but been in the front office pushing back saying, hold up, let him cook. Okay. Let him cook because because now that they have kind of just waited and 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 have had Dan Campbell get behind have a whole thing get behind Dan Campbell and them rallying around him. I mean, the dude is nuts, especially because he also I think does like a some of the drills like even with him. Yeah. Like with the but at the same time, I think that's been like such a rallying cry for the Lions. It's kind of something that has turned more so into a net positive over the last two, three seasons that that this is kind of something I've seen really start to be rolling over a certain amount of time. Yeah. Um... I think so we need we to move to on. Te- yes, <laughs> yes. I think we ended up delving a lot deeper than what we thought, but... But it's okay. Honestly, it was a big one. I can't it was complain. a big one. Honestly, I can't complain too much about it. All right, so now we go right into my team's game on Sunday. The Arizona Cardinals versus the Washington Commanders. The question I have, or that I kind of came up is this new era, same old commanders, or is a sense of something different coming, coming our coming DC's way? Um, I think what the Cardinals are doing, and yes, it seems comical, but I think the Cardinals are trying to go for their top uh pick in the draft in Caleb Williams, but at the same time. I don't know what the hell they're doing, so I don't know. But the Commanders, they seem like they have a positive uh, end going for them as Dan Schneider has finally uh, his corpse of what was his is finally uh, uh, kicked away from wherever it is. Take that back thing back where, back where it came from or so help me or so help me. Um, I think it's a new era for the Commanders. Especially because, yes, there's going to be some growing pains with Sam Howell. And they didn't really give him the time of day last season. So it's kind of like a throw-in-the-air situation of, okay, how do we deal with Sam Howell? It's kind of the same way that you deal with with really any any quarterback in a new situation or um, a new quarterback in a new like level of thing. It takes time. Um, is there a different a different thing coming for the Cardinals? Uh, I think they're not gonna be feel as much success as they did once. Uh, Kyler Murray is still up in the air about his injury with the uh ACL that he suffered late in the season last season. God knows what's gonna happen there. Um, I think Zach Ertz just got cleared to play like a couple weeks ago. But I don't know how he's gonna play with the backup. Colt McCoy is had been cut. F- well, fairly Josh recently. Dobbs was the 
No, Josh Dobbs uh, plays for the... Started the game. He started the game. Di didn't he? Does okay, maybe I thought he was... Oh, that makes sense. Because he got traded from the Browns to the Cardinals then, right? Something. Something along those lines. Maybe I got that mixed up with the Browns, because that's why I kind of cut you off there, because I was like, wait, didn't Dobbs still play with the Browns? But then I realized, wait, if if he was with the Browns, that means that Deshaun Watson... I'm connecting the dots now. Um, yeah, it makes sense now, because Dobbs and whoever they had that was trying to compete with him, they were like saying, oh, it would be a competitive edge or whatever situation which makes no goddamn sense either you have someone that's good enough for the job or someone that's a backup play you don't have it either or if the backup plays better then you play the backup there is no oh, oh let's play this game of chicken no have confidence for for god's sake anyways um yeah i don't know what the hell the cardinals are doing that's on them okay Here's why here's why I feel like there's some certain things that certain people in the fan base would say this is the same old this is the same old shtick. Number one. Okay, Josh Harris has said, or at least it has been speculated that it's been said, that everything is on the table as far as what's going on. But people took that as, oh, they're going to try and change the name back to the original name. Not exactly as Harris has had to come out and say that he's not he's not going to take the team and rename it back to the old name. Yeah, and that whole like viral thing was more because a organization that is more so like conservative was trying to get publicity on it which we won't really put much yeah. effort into that. that that's a new owner that it's an ownership change that honestly this could include like a different style of a rebrand they're having to do a whole bunch of other things that dan snyder never did or just felt like he was too stupid to do. Also, for the love of God, if he wanted to rebrand it back to the th one thing, do you think there would have been like a huge public outcry to have it back? Especially if they, it meant I costing were, more? Well, I think they were probably... I think they were under that outcry like as soon as Harris took over. I just think it's dumb that... like. If you're going to spend money on something, like, do it for the right reasons. Yeah. That's that's all I well, said. That's all I'm going to say. I think it was kind of dumb that they're like, oh, let's switch it back. And it's like, no, let's not. But then on top of that, like, he said everything was on the table. Yeah. But he has also said, but he has also said that with that everything on the table, it is not including going back to the original name. Yeah. So it's... So probably the potential of a name change and a rebrand is still... Like, is it still on the table? Yes. Is it on the table for how people wanted? For how mm, certain, no. certain people wanted it? No. But if uh, you're wanting <laughs> to kind of get rid of any semblance of what Dan Snyder has done... I don't even think you would want to go back to the original name. I think you tear down FedEx Stadium <laughs> at that point. <laughs> or go back to RFK what, RFK Field. There, there could be... I, I think they're... What I would hope for is I would hope for the team goes back into the city. In the city! But... Of D.C.? But I think you, I think that RF, the original RFK goes down. You tear down RFK, but with that longer term project, you build around, you build around 
that section there around RFK and rebuild. You more so just tear it down and rebuild something brand new there in its place while still paying tribute to RFK. Yeah. That is why... That's why I. That's what I think Josh Harris is probably thinking of doing. All right, should we do a speed round, or are we gonna keep going? Um, the sense of something, the sense of something different. I think there's something different coming with the commanders, but we don't fully know. We don't fully know the details of what, because the because the actual product on the field has kind of done some of the same old things. Yeah. Like even having the defense being able to step up late and secure secure the bag that we pretty much started out fumbling. No pun intended. Are <laughs> there no, no huddle? Uh there were a couple of fumbles lost. No, I was saying no huddle. No, I said I was saying a fumble bag like fumble bag, yeah. <laughs> But, but I feel like, I feel like what was more so different is that the fan base has gotten behind it. There were more Commanders fans, and Cardinals, granted that it's hard for the Arizona Cardinals fans to travel east. This will be an I'll believe it when I see it when Philly comes to town, or when the Giants come to town, or when Dallas comes to town. Yeah. But for an opening game, the fan base turnout that feels really, really good, I see progress. We now need to take that to division rivals and see where that goes from there. We find out that I think in late October, because I think the early October game is at with the Eagles. I think that's the first real taste of it. But speaking of the Eagles, the first major question I have with this is the lack of offensive numbers and yardage that on the Eagles side. Was this just a one-off out of the ordinary situation or a sign of things to come? Um... I think it's a sign of just the fact that the Eagles needed to um, just clean things up. As far as the offense goes, I think it'll be the same thing, but uh, maybe uh, less of Jalen Hurts QB sneaking, but who knows at the same time. Oh, I really no, don't no know. I don't think you're... You got Jason Kelsey there. You got to tailor to the 92. But where I'm at with this, I think that the lack of offensive productivity, I think was just... This was an aberrate. I think this was a, an exception from the norm. And the reason why? The elements. The elements forced the Eagles to change their philosophy on the game plan of the game. Yeah. They went to a more, they went to a more conservative try and not lose once they establish something. And yeah. they took advantage of the Patriots over aggression. And they, and they capitalized on those errors. So this was a sign that the Eagles could play, could play the could play the defensive long game, if they yeah. needed to. And they were a team that kind of has, that kind of has different approaches to winning games, which is a very scary thing in developing a championship team. Yep. So So I would say this for this answer is that the the offensive numbers and stats being low, this might be just a one-off thing. 
but it could be a sign of things to come in the sense of uh, in in more so the perspective of of how the Patriot or of how the Eagles can win games. Yeah. That the Eagles can win games by more than just the standard, oh, we're going to put up as many points as we can on the board. The next one, the Chargers-Dolphins. Which team do we feel like we learned more about in this high-scoring affair? Um, I think we learned more about the Dolphins as we figured out what Tua was... Uh, capable of after that big hiatus of not really playing much because of the concussion he suffered and how this has affected him now in the future. That's how I see it. I think we learned more about the Chargers. I think we learned more about the Chargers and kind of those different elements and wrinkles that Kellen Moore brings to the table in that this is a team that has the ceiling on the offense might have elevated itself a little bit, but it is held back by the floor that the defense brings them because the because the defense has not been as effective. I mean, Tua threw all over them, but I think a beauty of that has been that Tua has ways to try and not make the mistakes he did a year ago. So I think we've learned we learned a bit about both teams, but I think we learned a little more about what the Chargers can do. Like the capabilities of what the Chargers can do, especially on the offensive side of the ball. And Cowboys Giants are the Giants just an overachieving team from last season, or was last night a sign of untapped potential Cowboys coming out? Um, I think it was a sign of um the Giants just were lost, but at the same time <sighs> oh, that, I think they I think they good. definitely I think they definitely overachieved last season, but at the same time the Cowboys had a whole other beast of figuring out who their running backs were going to be while also having to deal with his, with Elliot because Elliot was not achieving very well last year and there was a lot of other things that were wrong with the Cowboys last year. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That, I think that whole Cowboys thing was more so a no-brainer. Yeah. As in, but, but realize also that Kellen Moore leaving, De- like being fired from Dallas, that changed the offensive philosophy of Dallas. That Kellen Moore was having so many more over the top throws that Dak Prescott was stakes. And, and this has now turned Dak more into a West Coast quarterback. Being able to make the shorter throws, the more consistent throws to ultimately like does Dak have the arm strength? Yes. But just because you have it doesn't mean that you have to use it. Yeah. So I I feel that Cowboys in a sense on the sense of rather than The of the Giants still obviously weren't that's a given. What what's been going on yeah. is that the cow I think the Cowboys are showing what their offensive philosophy is going to look like. Their defense, their defense definitely stifled the Giants, but some of that could have also been due to the elements and and Daniel Jones really just falling flat on his face. 
And Graham Gano just could not get his footing on that MetLife on that MetLife field to even get good field goals kicked. Simple as that. Yeah. That is why the Cowboys blanked them. The Giants had opportunities. They just couldn't cash in. And now we will go straight into the color commentary and our overreaction radar. The first game we're going to mention here is Packers-Bears. And the statement here is Green Bay is not as bad as we thought they were. Is this a statement with some validity? Or is this an overreaction? Um, I think... Um, <clears throat> honestly, I think we're, I don't think they were as bad as we thought because Jordan Love has more experience on his belt from Aaron Rodgers. Um, Jordan Love looked pretty good against the Bears, uh, in the game against them. And I think, honestly, I have no complaints for the Packers as they did well against the Bears. Here is what has been interesting. Green Bay has had smooth transitions with quarterbacks like the Steelers have had smooth transitions with head coaches. Or at least coaches having longer tenures there that there's not a lot of turnover in terms of who the starting quarterback for the Green Bay Packers is. Jordan Love, when drafted, everyone was thinking, why? Meanwhile, Green Bay is sitting over here thinking, why not? Like, why not? Because Jordan Love came from the same school that Aaron Rodgers did. And Aaron Rodgers would sit and learn things from Brett Favre just like Love did in learning from Aaron Rodgers. That not only has been able to try and find ways to extend Love's career in the sense of longevity, but also help develop Love as a quarterback to pretty much be in this position that we just had, that we just saw today, or, or well, saw yesterday. Simple as that. The next one that we're going to go to is Buccaneers-Vikings. And the statement is, the Vikings have crashed back down to Earth. Is there validity? Or is this an overreaction? I think it might be a bit of an overreaction, because it was a close game. I'm in agreement that it is an overreaction, but I would not be surprised if the Vikings start out the season 0-2. Not that Kevin O'Connell offense is not good. But I think that the Vikings are a team that can win tough games. They've shown it. Kirk Cousins has shown that he can be a winning quarterback. The real question is more so, is he a championship back, which still remains to be seen. But I think that these set, this was a game that definitely the Vikings probably should have had compared to some of their other ones. But, but I think that this is definitely, it's definitely different. This is a different year. And you kind of can't go by the... You can't rest on the same lore 
she had a year ago. And I'm just hoping that this does not cause too much trouble going forward. Otherwise, mm. the Detroit Lions are going to win the division. And the Vikings could be just sitting at home. Ravens, Texans. Lamar Jackson was worth the money spent. Um, I think you were right on that one. I think uh, it wasn't an overreaction that, that Lamar Jackson is worth the price of admission. I actually am going to say overreaction. I think it is an overreaction. And here's why. And the track record kind of shows that if you're the highest paid, if your quarterback is the highest paid player on a team, something gets severely held back by the offensive line. Your defense, your defense, your quarterback does not necessarily have to be the highest paid player in the room in order for you to win a championship. And I, I think even per year, I don't even think Mahomes was. Granted, that contract would span a long time. Yeah. But that... But those contracts get restructured all the time to make it easier for a deal to take place and to be able to make it a little better. Aaron Rodgers was not winning championships making $50 million a year. Were they winning? Were they winning NFC North championships? Yes, but were they getting to the Super Bowl? No. no. The math, con- like, so yes, I actually still, and I still, am not fully sold on Lamar Jackson. Truly, number one as a champ quarterback. You are making. You basically have given Lamar Jackson championship quarterback money. When I don't think he's a championship quarterback yet. Or has the or has the passing discipline to be a championship level quarterback. So that's why I went the way I did. Yeah. Browns, Bengals, we have two of them. Deshaun Watson is now a viable quarterback again. Is this have validity? Or is it an overreaction? I think it's validity in a sense, but it could be also an overreaction because it's just one game. Against a rival. I think it's about... I'm actually going to give it validity. I'm going to give this one validity and that this is not as much of an overreaction as I think. Deshaun Watson is showing what he can do. But I think he kind of needs to... But I think there needs to be an improved sense of consistency in the sense of what that's going to fully look like in a bigger sample size. I think it's got validity. It just... We just need to... We may need... This more so may need to be one of those situations where our reaction kind of says we kind of need to hold up, hold up and let them cook. Yeah. But... Out of this also, 
we also had this statement. The Bengals are no longer the top team in the AFC North. Validity or overreaction? Overreaction. I believe this is an overreaction. Yeah, the Bengals... This game was definitely one where Burrow got... He got curb stomped by the elements. Miles Garrett is probably one of the best pass rushers in the league. I could see why... Burrow may Burrow had a much rougher game than what was expected. So this probably was more an overreaction rather than something that it's a loss that I think the Bengals could afford. Yeah. But they can't afford too many more like that if they Stay at the top. And then Rams Seahawks, the last one here. Geno Smith's 2022 season was a fluke. Validity Uh, or overreaction? Overreaction. Hmm. This is where I am going to we might I'm thinking we might have to let this one I might want to have to let this one stew a little bit. Because apparently Aaron Donald did scare Geno Smith on a box, but when does Aaron Donald <laughs> not scare? That's what I was about to say. It was like, when does he not pee someone, make someone pee a little? But I'm going to say that for right now, for right now, I am going to give, I'm going to give this validity, but I got to let it cook. Geno Smith went 16 for, and and I'm going to, and we're going to look back at the stat line. Geno Smith, 16 for 26 for 112 yards. One touchdown, no picks. But, granted, that the Rams also possessed the ball for nearly two-thirds of that game. So Gino only had the ball for just over 20 minutes. In, t- in time of possession. And there's only so much that you can do without the ball in your hands. But but I think if you're going to continue to have numbers like that come out of Geno Smith, then then that's kind of then that's kind of where we're at. kind of where we're at rather than that I think 2022 was a fluke and now we move on to the primetime game results last week Ruckus and I had a deal or no deal involving running backs and Ruckus and Ruckus definitely he probably had like a net a net loss in terms of his because he I think he ended up I think what did I calculate yesterday Ruckus that you ended up with a or had you stuck with the case you had yep that you took the Texans because I kind of gave you Damien I kind of handed Damien Pierce to you on a silver platter and you took it much earlier than you wanted while you still had the Eagles and Kenneth Gainwell and you ended up with 21 or 12 point 12.3 points as opposed to maybe like 13 or 14 with the with the Eagles 
But then meanwhile, I ended up passing on a good offer and ended up with the Chargers running backs. And I probably could have said that I ended up with just Austin Eckler. Eckler's won me a fantasy football game, and Eckler also wins me the primetime game. So for the NFL, so for the NFL challenges, we did not decide to do one this week. But as far as this NFL season and kind of some primetime, some primetime things we'll figure out. Spenis takes the first one. <laughs> and Ruckus, we're getting ready to close out the close out the episode. Yes, sir. Let's get right to the stud and dud. And All we right. will go with you. Alright, I'll start it off. So for our stud, I have rookies Rasheed Rice and Bijan Robinson for both getting their first NFL touchdowns of their career. Rasheed Rice with his touchdown in the red zone, and the same for uh, Bajan Mustard Robinson with his first NFL touchdown getting a one yard carry. And then for my dud, it is Jamar Chase's comments about the Browns and the new Elves logo and they have on the field. Also saying he can't believe the Bengals lost to a bunch of Elves. And also went on further about calling the Browns the Elves. Spenis, <laughs> take it over. What what was Jabbar Chase like thinking? Was he not was he thinking, thinking that the team was was he thinking that the team was from Keebler? I think he thought that the food groups mainly consisted of um candy canes, cookies. uh cookies. <laughs> yeah, cookies, candy canes, sugar plums, spaghetti, uh maple syrup and some other stuff like an elfwood. But what he forgot to do was drink a two liter of Coke and then belch really loudly. You're welcome, but fans. But then I of... also saw the also saw the meme that that basically somebody just commentated him like saying that he was like Sauron for the Lord of the Rings, talking about that he can't believe he a bunch of L. Pat who? Pat Mahomes. Pat who? <laughs> Pat Mahomes. All right. Though there had been a lot of, for me, I am actually going to go with my honorable mention first. Novak Djokovic and paying honor to Kobe Bryant after winning the U.S. Open, his 24th Grand Slam major. But, my stud for this week. Though there had been a lot of Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia love in terms of the college realm. Naeem Kearney in Georgetown having a great game. Malachi Brown having a 100-yard kick return touchdown. And, and a pretty good game also against Edinburgh. There was one Bulldog, or one former Martinsburg Bulldog, that kind of sticks out above the rest from this weekend. And his name is Hudson Clement. Now, now hear me out. This is the same guy that just a couple of years ago won a West Virginia Gatorade Player of the Year in a 62-21 to victory over Huntington in the state championship game where he caught where he had eight touchdowns. He had a record, he had a state championship record of eight touchdowns where he caught four, rushed for three, and threw one 
in the state championship game. And there is a reason that he is called Tutty Huddy. Because basically what he had was a game where he was catching catching passes and a good amount of those and actually 60% of the catches he had were for touchdowns. So, for West Virginia University wide receiver and a former Martinsburg Bulldog, Hudson Clement, of course, seeing the articles under Tutty Huddy, his stat line, five catches, 177 yards, and three touchdowns. The long, the long on the touchdowns was a 70-yarder. He had a 14... He had a 14 yarder and a third, well, I mean, another 39 yard grab, but then had a 70 yard. Let's see, he had a, it was a 14 yard touchdown, a 46 yard touchdown, and then he also had like a big 70 yard catch. So that. So that is a whole on top of that. He was a walk-on at WVU. That performance against Duquesne earned him his athletic scholarship. So that is why my stud is in college football this past weekend. And kind of brings a tie to back home. All right. Now my dud. My honorable mention here involves Baltimore Orioles prospect Jackson Holiday for having to talk the hotel staff in Norfolk into getting him a hotel room after called up to AAA because of his useful look. He turns 20 in December. So he's a 19-year-old trying to ask for a hotel room, but yet, in the face, he looks no more than, like, four years younger than what he, than what he already does. But, I mean, he's got the long, like, the long flow locks, the, and a baby face, so you kind of could see that. But my real dud... Goes to a team that kind of majorly fumbled the bag. And that is the Milwaukee Brewers on Sunday. They had pitched to a combined no-hitter through 11 innings. So yes, the Yankees had not had a hit in 11 innings. And, of course, the game was tied going into extras. They, and you would normally think, oh, a team hasn't gotten a hit in 11 innings. You would think that the Brewers would win this game, right? Wrong. They lost it 4-3 to three to the Yankees in the 13th. They, they choked the no-hitter in the 12th. And then gave up and then lost the game in the 13th. So, yes. My dud goes to the Milwaukee Brewers for completely fumbling the bag. Bruckus, take us out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to our awesome podcast. And this is episode number 69. Again, nice. Um, of the Ruckus and the Mess Sports Podcast. Thank you for listening every week and this week. And make sure to watch our primetime games for our Super Bowl race. And we are about to get into week number four this week. Um, make sure you listen to it on, or not listen to it, uh, watch it on Friday. 
or listen to it either way. Um, Videos any- for that will be released as follows. On the 15th, Ruckus's video will will air at 10 a.m. Mine will be airing at 11. Mine, just as a heads up, is a lot shorter than normal. Kind of due to just... I've been trying to mix up the approach of my of my videos to kind of see what's working and what's not. Yep. So, so we will... So we will have that we will have that for you on at the late morning on Friday. Anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed our podcast this week. Uh let us know what we're doing right and wrong. Leave a like, leave a dislike if you didn't like the video. But anyways, we'll see you later. Have a good one. Deuces.